Great. I think we've got about 70 odd people on the course. So it's it's lovely to sort of yeah be with you on this sort of snowy day um, talking about R&D tax credits. Um, so thank you for joining um, this webinar um, on R&D claims and the cost of getting it wrong. Um, and this is a very topical subject at the moment. Um, you may well have seen lots of press announce releases in the Times, the Sunday Times and lots of other places on the amount of fraud and abuse that HMRC perceive is in the R&D regime at the moment. And they've estimated roughly half a billion of fraud and abuse. And that's a massive figure. Um, so they're, having, they're clamping down on R&D tax relief. Um, they're sending nudge letters out. And we understand that something like 2,000 nudge letters have been sent to companies going, have another look at your R&D claims. We think there's something wrong. We want you to basically own up to your mistakes before we come sort of probing and asking you questions. Um, so I'm Carrie Rutland. I'm a partner in the R&D team at BDO. Um, I'm joined by um, two fantastic specialists. So James Goyen in our tax disputes team. So he deals with HMRC in resolving inquiries. Um, and um, when it all really goes sort of slightly pear-shaped and you end up at tribunal, we've got um, Ed Hellier, who's a barrister, um, who's worked on some sort of really interesting prominent cases and he'll be talking through yeah what happens if you sort of start getting to that tribunal stage um, but first of all I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about how do you get your claims right the first time so how do you minimize the likelihood of an inquiry um, because the chances are HMRC aren't going to do some sort of random inquiry there's going to be a trigger point that will mean that they launch that inquiry. So I, we'll have a look at some of the trigger points that we've seen um, in HMRC sort of conversations with HMRC recently, just to give you some tips to, to how to avoid that inquiry. Um, but first, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we've got about 100 people on this um, call at the moment. So if you've got any questions, could you put them in the Q&A um, and then we'll pick them up at the end um, and that means it gives everybody time to present, to get through our sort of, got quite a bit of material. Um, so it will allow, allow the process to sort of flow slightly better. Brilliant, next slide. So these are the biggest mistakes that we see um, on, on our R&D claims when we're brought in to help close out an inquiry. Um, and these are some of the red flags to HMRC. And I've started off with some of the technical areas. Um, there's been quite a lot of confusion about the two R&D regimes, so the SME and the large company regime. Um, and quite often, if you've got a PE-backed um, company or some other sort of complicated group structure, um, companies might think they can claim under the SME regime, but because of the, the LinkedIn Partner Enterprises rules, actually, they have to claim under the large company or the RDEC regime. So that's the first area where people tend to sort of not necessarily get it right. So if you've got a complicated group structure, I'd really encourage you to have a look at it, have a look at those LinkedIn partner enterprise rules and just check that you're claiming under the right scheme. Closely linked to that is subcontracted and subsidized R&D. And this has to be the single biggest HMRC hot topic at the moment. Um, and I think Ed worked on one, some of the cases um, that relate to subsidized and subcontracted R&D. So I'm, I won't steal his thunder, um, but HMRC are asserting that actually, if somebody else is paying for that R&D, so it's subsidized or it's subcontracted, then you have to claim under the large company regime. You can't claim as an SME. So that's another area. If you're working on customer contracts, it's really getting to the bottom of those customer contracts and making sure you understand them and analyze them and you know who's can claim. Um, another thing, another big red flag is claiming for commercial projects rather than scientific or technological advances. Or I'll link it to the next one, or failing to um, properly explain um, to HMRC where the, the complexity is in terms of technology or engineering. So technical narratives really need to get into that nitty gritty of actually what's going on at a scientific or technical level. They're not interested in whether or not the project saves you costs, improves um, profitability, margins, saves you time. Those are all commercial outputs. What they're interested in is how you do that. What's the technical or scientific 
to advance that allows you to achieve that commercial aim. So making sure your technical narratives are really strong and robust um, and sending in technical narratives to HMRC is key to avoiding an inquiry. And you can virtually guarantee that if you don't send in an R&D report to HMRC, you will go into inquiry. Um, and that's changed since I started out doing R&D. Uh, way back when, you either used to be able to have a conversation with um, HMRC um, and get them comfortable before you submitted the claim, or you didn't always have to send in a report. Um, but now it's, it's almost uh, mandatory and it will be mandatory from later on in the year. Uh, the other thing that I've seen quite a lot is foreign businesses with UK subsidiaries applying the foreign company R&D rules to the UK R&D claim. Um, there are a lot of sort of similarities between the um, R&D regimes across the world, but they're not identical. So just if in doubt, get that advice, make sure that you're applying the right rules for the right country's claim. Next slide. Okay, so some practical things that also go wrong in R&D claims. Um, furlough. Um, so obviously furlough was a big topic during um, COVID. Um, furloughed people, by and large, cannot be included in R&D claim. So an HMRC will know who's claimed CJRS. Um, so if you include furlough people in your R&D claim, they can do those sort of checks and that's likely to sort of prompt you into an inquiry. Um, Claiming for a large number of consumables in your project. So stand back, have a look at your um, qualifying costs and look at the ratios. And if your staff costs are quite low and you've got a large amount of consumables or a large amount of third party costs in your claim, that's a very simple sort of analytical check that HMRC can do um, and will quite often um, trigger an inquiry because HMRC will go actually if it's your R&D project, how come you've got um, so few staff working on it? Um, the other things, um, I think, are sort of, by and large, I've, I've probably covered them before. So insufficient paperwork, not providing a sufficient um, detailed, or just putting in sort of spurious claims. Um, and I, I can't imagine any of you are putting in a sort of claims that are, are spurious, but I think if an advisor comes to you and says, we can promise you the world in terms of R&D tax credit. You, this project that you didn't think qualified for R&D relief, well, really it does. I just stand back and say, is it too good to be true? Because just doing that sense check of, is it too good to be true? will probably give you a good feel of actually, is, a, is your R&D claim robust? Um, and if you as a company are not comfortable with what's going in, then you must challenge it because it's not good enough for you to say anymore oh, I relied on the advisor, they told me it was R&D. Um, HMRC are expecting the company to take ownership of it, to understand the claims and to understand the areas that are being claimed for. So really probe your advisor, make sure you understand the claim and make sure you get the R&D report um, from the advisor before it's submitted um, so that if there is an HMRC challenge, you can help defend it. Okay, next slide. So if it wasn't complicated enough already, this is what's going on. These are the stages of reform that are happening to the R&D regime. And I'm not going to go into the sort of the detail here, but we've basically got three sets of reforms going on, all with three different implementation dates. So we've got the overseas costs, um, sort of cloud costs, pure math, and that's for accounting periods beginning on or after the 1st of April, um, 23. We've got the rate changes which apply for costs incurred after 1st of April 23. So if you're a December year end, you're going to have to split your claim into two claim periods. Um, we've got the R&D consultation on a single scheme, which theoretically would come in from April 24. We've got the House of Lords saying, actually, let's stand back a bit. This is all a, a lot of stuff going on. Is HMRC adequately resourced to deal with it? Have we given time, companies time to transition? Um, and we've got the additional information, which is the fourth box at, um, at the bottom um, requirements that HMRC have announced and that are going to come in this year. Um, and if you're not on top of them, that's probably the single biggest thing to actually 
make sure you understand and get on top of. So if we flip forward another slide, and can you go one more? We'll send you these slides afterwards um, so you can read through them. And the next one. So this is the type of inf additional information that will be required for all R&D claims from later on in the year. So some of this should be in the R&D report that you get from your R&D advisors. Some of it is additional information. So do you give your VAT reference number when you send in your R&D claim? Do you give the name and address of your agent to allow HMRC to do agent profiling? Does the senior officer of the company endorse the R&D claim? So personally sign off the R&D claim. Um, there will be specified levels of narratives. So it's no longer up to companies to decide how many technical narratives they submit. HMRC are mandating it. They're also mandating the cost breakdowns. And if you use um, consultants or contractors on your R&D claims, you're going to need to give the PAYE and um, reference number of that company that that contractor is engaged through. So that's a bit of a linkage between R&D tax credits and um, IR35 or off payroll labor. So HMRC trying to make that link of actually, does your whole tax stack up or is your R&D telling you a different story from what you've submitted in terms of off payroll labor? And so this goes back to that whole premise of actually there being red flags in HMRC's systems that are saying, this doesn't quite make sense. Um, so really just making sure that your, your transfer price and your off payroll labor, your R&D are all telling the same story. So you're not giving HMRC that, that sort of ammunition to launch an inquiry. Next slide, please. So this is a slide just talking about the rate changes that are coming in from the 1st of April. Um, there's been a lot in the press uh, about sort of, is it fair, particularly for SMEs, because there's a massive reduction um, in terms of SME um, rates. It's good news for RDEC, but SMEs, if you're loss making, you're going from 33% um, subsidy to just about 19%. So just make sure that um, your accounting software is, is doing this and you're put, getting the right rates. Next slide. There's also the consultation out on the single um, R&D regime. I'm not going to go through this here, um, but if you've got any questions or comments, very happy to take them in the chat or have a follow up conversation um, just to give you a sort of to allow you to have your say. And actually, if you were redesigning the R&D regime, uh, what would you do? Next slide. So just to recap. And we've looked at some of the ways that mistakes occur in your R&D claims. Um, and now we'll move a little bit to actually to, to the, what are the implications if, if you do get your R&D claim wrong. Um, the first one is the delay. So quite often HMRC will um, say, actually, they won't pay out your R&D claim. They won't give you that refund because they'll ask more questions. Um, and HMRC are under-resourced. So it, whilst a taxpayer has 30 days to respond to an HMRC letter, that quite often there can be sort of months going on between HMRC, you sending your response in and HMRC replying. Um, the expense of dealing with an HMRC inquiry, um, if you have to sort of go to tax disputes, if you have to go to tax council. Um, what happens if you've booked your R&D um, credit in your accounts? Do you actually need to change it if you go have an inquiry and you lose that inquiry? If you've got prior year misstatements, um, what happens in terms of your reputation externally and your sort of risks, is it going to impact your BRR and your risk profile with HMRC and therefore lead to greater scrutiny in other areas? So it really is, if you can get your R&D claim right um, so that you don't get yourself into inquiry territory, that's gotta be good news for everybody. Next slide. So BDO, BDO has um, got a number of ways, actually we help companies. Um, in protecting their R&D claims and just getting themselves more comfortable. And probably the most important of this is the benchmarking tool. So we prepare roughly a thousand R&D claims a year. Um, so we, and we're also tax agents for a number of companies. So we've got a lot of proprietary data on R&D claims in various sectors. Um, and what the benchmarking tool allows us to do 
is take some specific information about your company, some sector information um, based on Companies House and our proprietary data, and give you a feel for where your R&D claim should land. Um, and it's a feel. It, it gives you that insight to actually say, am I claiming more than the industry or the sector average? And that might be totally justifiable, but HMRC probably has a benchmarking tool too. And so if you are claiming more than the industry average, the quality and the explanation you would need to give to HMRC is a lot higher than if you're claiming on average or below average. Um, we also do detailed reviews of past claims. Um, we help companies um, put, put right to any errors if they spot them, so voluntary disclosure, um, deal with HMRC um, nudge letters. Um, we keep people abreast of the R&D changes. And also increasingly what I'm helping um, companies do is put in a mechanism to capture R&D in real time. So don't wait till the end of the year to do your R&D claim. Can you be capturing the information, the costs in year? Because that gives you a much soft, more robust and solid R&D claim um, for submitting to HMRC with your tax comp. So these are just a, a couple of ways that actually BDO helps our, helps our clients. Um, and yeah, make sure that your R&D claims go in smoothly, are processed, you get that the refund you're expecting, and we don't end up in um, disputes territory. Um, so on that note, I'm gonna hand over to James just to talk about actually what happens when it does go wrong. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm James Gorin, I'm Senior Manager in our Tax Dispute Resolution Team. Our TDR team deals with all manager, manner of um, inquiries and investigations at HMRC. We also make voluntary disclosures on behalf of our clients to HMRC, where we've found historic tax errors that need to be uh, notified to HMRC. Um, I spent four years in, in BDO, prior to that, 16 years in HMRC in various investigation roles. And this is my first webinar, so I'm really nervous. Um, next slide, please. As Carrie mentioned, R&D is a real hot topic for HMRC. The headline figure is £469 million, the latest estimated loss from fraud or error, which is nearly 5% of all claims, mainly in the SME segment. And there's been a lot of um, press coverage, trade press, and in uh, nationwide press in the Times, as Carrie mentioned. Um, so there's a lot of scrutiny on the R&D regime and perceived fraud, uh, fraudulent claims. Um, so HMRC have been proactive in addressing this. They've nearly doubled the size of the R&D compliance team. We understand that at least 100 additional um, R&D tax inspectors undertaking inquiries. And as a result, obviously, a lot more R&D inquiries. Um, HMRC have inc increased their random inquiry program, which is exactly that. They open inquiries at random. The results of that feed into that statistical analysis. But that means um, companies are more, more at risk of having an inquiry open into them. Um, Carrie's mentioned nudge letter campaigns. Uh, around 2,000 uh, nudge letters went out in January um, to, to certain companies suggesting that directors look at uh, their latest claims and, uh, and maybe uh, look at them in a bit more detail and revise them if necessary. Um, we've got a point on fraud investigation service. We know there are currently at least nine live criminal investigations into R&D claims across about 1,300 uh, fraudulent claims at HMRC or HMRC suspected fraudulent claims. But fraud, uh, FIS, or the Fraud Investigation Service, has also been invi involved in the nudge letter campaign and issued nudge letters for over a thousand uh, taxpayers last summer to suggest that the, the R&D claims submitted to them were perceived as fraudulent and that HMRC weren't going to process them in the spur of information that provided to them. And there's, just been, there's also been a general delay in processing of R&D claims and, and payment of those claims. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to quickly try and run through the HMRC R&D inquiry process. This is a massive subject, uh, so I'm trying to cover it in one slide and three minutes, so real high level stuff. So essentially, company, if a company submits an R&D claim to HMRC, broadly HMRC have around about a year to open an inquiry into that claim, a bit longer for a the claim when it's an amended tax return. An inquiry is opened, you get the dreaded brown envelope there on the right with the inquiry notice, essentially a long list of documents and information HMRC think they need in order to check your claim. Um, I mentioned the R&D compliance teams have got a lot larger lately and we think some of those inspectors may be a little inexperienced in dealing with either investigations or R&D matters or potentially both. What we're seeing is a um, real detailed request for every type of information or document that HMRC think they may need in order to, to 
check the uh, an R&D claim, including information that may have already been submitted to HMRC, for instance, in the R&D inquiry technical review report. So Carrie mentioned, uh, it's a, a, an R&D inquiry requires a lot of time invested in it in order to respond to HMRC. Provision of a, a lot of information within 30 days. Um, it may be that HMRC may not respond to that information immediately. And what we're seeing is rather than coming to a conclusion, HMRC issue another letter requesting even more information, more information, and more information. Um, one of our clients, I think on their, third, on their third letter, had been asked 54 questions by HMRC without getting to uh, a conclusion on, on their R&D claim. What that means is the an R&D inquiry could last six to 12 months before reaching any sort of conclusion, which means by that time, the next year's R&D claim has to go to HMRC. As the first inquiry pit, uh, claim hasn't been agreed with HMRC, HMRC are likely to open inquiry its most recent claim. Uh, and carry on investigating matters. Um, if errors are found, HMRC will expect repayment of ta R and D tax credits or uh, um, R and uh, tax set off. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, um, any adjustments to HMRC are unlikely to be focused just on the inquiry year. HMRC operates under the presumption of continuity, which means that all facts being equal, if there's an error identified in one year, it's likely that HMRC will look to see whether that er error occurred in earlier periods. So, for instance, if um, uh, qualified staff costs are reduced from, let's say, 100% to 70% in one year, HMRC will expect that reduction to apply to other periods if the same factual position is in place, which means that R&D repayments aren't focused just on the one year. HMRC can go back and put settlements into earlier periods. HMRC can go back a minimum of four years regardless of the reason for an error occurring in a tax return. Um, and so that's obviously a, a big financial impact on a settlement with H HMRC. Uh, I've got, I've jumped to point eight there on, on agent carelessness. If, agent, if HMRC consider that an error has occurred with an R&D claim based on, because of carelessness, HMRC can go back and look at tax assessments for a six year period rather than four years. And recently we've, um, HMRC have been extending this to carelessness on the on the, by an R&D advisor acting on behalf of uh, a, a tax plan company, which means that even if directors have taken reasonable care and acted responsibly by approaching an R&D specialist for advice, then the R&D specialist has made an error. If HMRC think the specialist has made a careless error, that carelessness can be attributed to the company and HMRC can still look at raising assessment for the last six years. Penalties, um, if there are tax adjustments owed to HMRC, HMRC will definitely consider whether a penalty is appropriate. Penalties are determined by the underlying behaviour which led to a, an error in the R&D claim. Uh, there are no penalties if the directors took reasonable care. For instance, if there's deemed carelessness, the minimum penalty when there's an inquiry open is 15% of the, the tax due to HMRC, rising potentially up to 30%. And that point there on agent carelessness potentially comes in there. Uh, information powers. When HMRC open an open inquiry, they request a lot of documents and information that's considered an informal request um, for information from the, from the director from the company. If that in document, if those documents and information aren't forthcoming to HMRC, a formal request will be made, which is essentially cutting and pasting the shopping list of information into a, a rather more strongly worded letter. But that gives an additional 30 days to reply to HMRC, will result in financial penalties if the information isn't supplied to HMRC. And at the end of the inquiry process, if there are penalties for deemed carelessness, for example, the minimum penalty increases because HMRC think that the directors haven't fully cooperated with the inquiry process. And the last point there on, on nudge letters, a nudge letter isn't the same as an inquiry. A nudge letter, uh, there's no um, obligation to reply to HMRC if, in, if you're in receipt of a nudge letter, or it, uh, it does show that your HMRC is compliance radar. Unfortunately, if there's a nudge letter, if a company receives a nudge letter and you approach HMRC to disclose um, errors in the, in the historic R&D claims, for penalty purposes, that's considered a prompted disclosure and the minimum penalty is that 15% band if there's carelessness. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, an example of a HMRC information request. Probably can't read on the slide on the screens now, so there's something to look at when the slides come out to you. But it gives you an idea of the the, the detail of information that HMRC requested. Some focus on R&D, some focus on expenditure, and then talking about other evidence that HMRC expects going forward. 
Um, next slide, please. So this is two example nudge letters um, and two examples of professional redaction. Um, the nudge letter on the left is from the recent a recent um, campaign from the R and D compliance team. And this is a, a letter sent out to a director to say, I think you really need to check your claim. We understand that certain R and D advisors are making claims that perhaps are, don't have a lot of basis in fact, and you should really check check your claim, please. The, the claim on the right was actually from fraud investigation services is a bit more strongly worded and essentially said we think the R&D claim is fraudulent and we're not going to process it unless you provide us with further information. Next slide, please. So voluntary disclosures. What can you do if as a result of maybe this, this talk, you go back and you find historic um, errors in your R&D claims or for instance, we've had clients that have gone through a due diligence process in the sale of business and found some R&D skeletons in the cloud cupboard. Or maybe the fact we found out that a competitor has received a nudge letter and want to get ahead of the curve and notify HMRC of R&D errors before receiving any sort of notice, the company receiving notice themselves. With a voluntary disclosure to HMRC, that's essentially an unprompted approach to HMRC, set up details of errors in historic R&D claims, quantify the, the liability and pay the, the difference to HMRC. Unfortunately, you still have to pay late payment interest. And the real benefit of a voluntary disclosure is that there's uh, the mitigation of penalties when um, a disclosure completely unprompted. And that's for careless errors that would otherwise attract a penalty of at least 15% if there was an inquiry. That minimum penalty position is reduced to nil for a voluntary disclosure. Some of you out there may think, why would we make a voluntary disclosure if, for instance, the inquiry window is closed? for a historic claim that HMRC can't do anything about it. I've already mentioned HMRC have um, discovery powers and go back potentially four to six years. In the case of four, they can go at 20 years. So by acting proactively and letting HMRC know of errors identified in historic R&D claims, you get that beneficial penalty mitigation. Um, peace of mind of the last point there. Um, it provides a, an opportunity to provide that the details to HMRC and that third point there, control of relevant, relevant information. It may sound slightly suspicious, but the point there is HMRC opening an inquiry requests lots of information and any, any documents or anything they think is relevant in any way whatsoever to the R&D claim. Some of, that, some of the documents or information may not be relevant to the claim, but because HMRC have made a request, uh, the company is really obliged to supply that, that, those, that information to HMRC, which can be a long draw out process. As Carrie mentioned, HMRC typically gives 30 days for uh, directors or a company to supply information requested, but then may sit on that, the thing supplied to them for a month or two before making a further request for information. By making a voluntary disclosure, when we work at our clients, we make sure we're really focused on, on the issue, focused on the R&D errors, making sure we correct the position, but tell, we can tell HMRC perhaps how the error arose, why it won't arose, rise again in, in the future, and package that up in a nice little box for HMRC, and give it to them so they have all the information to uh, uh, amend the R&D position, and, and then move on with that, with, um, asking more um, further questions, which um, have a time and an expense cost for the company. Next slide, please. So how can our TDR team help with R&D inquiries? Well, our tax dispute team works really closely with Carrie and her team um, for the provision of, um, for Carrie's team to provide technical advice on historic R&D claims. Or we can use as a tax dispute team, use our knowledge of HMRC's inquiry powers and processes, their information powers. Make sure that the R and, R and, uh, the tax inspector is really focused on the key areas and the risk and making sure we address the risk and provide all the information to HMRC that they require to move things forward, rather than just perhaps um, working with a uh, sort of correspondence tennis backwards and forwards requesting the information between the two parties and things drag on for months and months and months. Make sure both sides understand what the real risks are risks are and then address those risks. We've got the use of ADR, which is alternative dispute resolution. And that's essentially um, either using a, a, a H, an independent HMRC mediator or a third me, third party mediator, bringing together the client, uh, services tax dispute as experts and uh, our own internal R&D experts and meeting with HMRC's experts to make sure we understand why they're not accepting a claim and to make sure that they understand um, 
how the business operates, the segment they operate in, and how the R and D is relevant to how that to, to the business they're that they're, they're um, participating in. We've had really really good results with that in the past, where through correspondence, two in trends positions, but no movement, but through ADR and through that discussion, we're able to agree the R and D uh, claims on behalf of our client. It's also time to pay discussions. Obviously, business um, environments are quite the environment's quite challenging at the moment. Um, and maybe there's a liability owed to HMRC, but the company is unable to pay that in one in one go. We can enter into discussions with HMRC to try and agree an instalment arrangement of payment that over time, rather than having to pay everything in one month at time. And obviously, with penalties, we can make sure that HMRC follows its own penalty guidance, mitigate penalties to the lowest position if a penalty is due, and even where if a careless penalty is due to HMRC, explore whether those penalties could be suspended by putting in, in suspension conditions over the next couple of years. Um, so finally, yeah, we work to, uh, very closely with uh, um, Carrie's R&D team to make sure we can correct the past, while also making sure that R&D claims are um, correct in the future. We've had a couple of clients where we made a voluntary disclosure to HMRC, managed to put the R&D claims in the past into a correct position to quantify liability, agree there's no penalty due to HMRC, also agree the future, uh, future or current year, R&D claims and use the tax credits from those claims against the liabilities for arising from the inquiry for real cash flow benefit. Um, so if you want to discuss R&D inquiries in more detail, please give me a call or email after, after this, um, these slides go out to you. I'm happy to have a no obligation call or discussion with anyone. And there's also a question and answer session at the end of this, we're hoping you'll keep Carrie and Ed really busy. So thanks for listening and I'll pass over to Ed. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, hopefully you can all see and more importantly, hear me. Uh, thanks very much, Trevor, for joining and thanks to BDO for uh, inviting me on this talk. Uh, I think it's particularly prescient to have a discussion about these topics at this time. Um, there's a lot of litigation that's going through um, and HMRC are clearly um, pushing. This is an area. Um, in fact, I was up late last night going through documents in relation to one of my um, R&D appeals. Uh, so if this turns into a personal therapy session or me venting, please, um, I can only apologize. Um, next slide, please. What I will try and look at um, are, first of all, some of the specific legal issues from the R&D cases that I'm involved in uh, and that I know are progressing through into the tribunal system and secondly look at some from that some broader practical considerations uh, for things that you can do to guard against having to go to, into litigation which i know no one likes um, or if you are forced into it how to, how to win that uh, litigation so next slide please first on to the litigation that we're seeing uh, progressive at the moment. This is primarily, um, or, or what I've largely been seeing, is on the SME uh, R&D relief or the enhanced R&D relief under the Corporation Tax Act 2009 Part 13. Um, broadly, I'm sure most of you are aware of it, but just broadly what's required in order for this to be able to be claimed, our uh, R&D work must be carried out. Uh, it must be carried out by an SME, uh, which is to say up to 500 staff turnover of up to 100 million euros, balance sheet of up to 86 million euros. Um, it can't be R&D work funded by state aid um, or expenditure that is subsidised. Uh, and it can't be incurred on activities which are contracted out to the claimant company by any other person. Uh, now, there are a number of cases working through um, to the tribunal, uh, in particular on the subsidised and subcontracted issues. Uh, I'm involved in two uh, representing the taxpayer, and I know of one other that is going to be going to the first tier tribunal, uh, likely before the end of the year. Uh, and I know there are a good deal others that have stayed behind those appeals um, so it's a it's a pretty hot topic at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> turning to those particular 
issues i subsidized or subcontracted um what do they mean what do they apply what what's the test we're applying what are hmrc arguing uh well first on subsidized uh the test um is in short that you can't claim for expenditure where on r d uh, activities where it's paid for by subsidies or grants or otherwise met by another person uh, now, there is a very good decision of the first tier tribunal uh, in Quinn um, that concerns a construction and refurbishment company that made a claim uh, for R&D SME relief. HMRC um, said no, the, the, the uh, Quinn's expenditure was subsidised for the purposes of the Act, and they went off to the tribunal. Uh, the taxpayer won that appeal. Uh, and on the basis that, well, the taxpayer won that appeal in relation to the subsidised point on the basis that there was not a clear link between the price paid to Quinn um, and the expenditure on the R&D that it carried out. So there the FTT said that it can't simply be because you end up charging a price for a contract and that price in part funds your R&D work, that it is therefore subsidised because they say, well, otherwise then what would be left um, that could claim R&D relief? Um, and I think that's a good decision and it's one that's worth reading. Um, broadly, when, when you're applying it, how do you sort of apply, Quinn, what are you looking at? Um, you're looking at issues like, what's the bargain between you, the company, and the person you're contracting with? Um, are there um, specific costs allocated to R&D expenditure? Um, is the client asking you to carry out particular R&D work and paying for that? Um, where does the um, commercial risk of undertaking the R&D lie? Is it with you, the company, or with um, your client? Um, and is there a clear link between the R&D um, undertaken and the price paid. Um, I should note that in the appeals that are going through to the first year tribunal, HMRC are relying in part on a position that says that Quinn was wrongly decided. Um, now, they're entitled to do that because the first tier tribunal doesn't create binding precedent, i.e. later tribunals aren't bound by its decisions. Um, it's slightly odd that they didn't appeal Quinn itself, um, but that's the position that we're in. Uh, and HMRC are arguing for a much broader view of um, subsidised that would include um, cases such as Quinn. Um, that said, I think Quinn is a good decision. I think it's well reasoned. Um, I think it's um, is, 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 is easy to read and sets out um, the principles um, for subsidised, and I'd recommend reading it if you've got an issue around subsidised um, expenditure. The second is subcontracted. Uh, now, this is a bit less clear on the law, and it's, the, the, the questions here are a little broader. Uh, we do have a decision uh, in the case of Hadi Engineering uh, and HMRC, that concerned an engineering company that carried out um, a series of development projects. Um, it's, it's, it's no critique to the judge, um, but the decision in Hadi is a little less clear on the underlying principles uh, than in Quinn. Uh, but I still recommend reading it if you're dealing with this sort of um, area. Um, if nothing else, because it helps show the contrast uh, in between Quinn and this in an appeal where someone's brought all the facts together, marshaled them uh, clearly, and therefore gets a sensible, um, readable decision um, versus Hadi, where it seems as though the evidence um, and points before the tribunal were perhaps less clear. So it shows that contrast in the way in which one runs litigation. Uh, secondly, is, is just because of some of the names of the projects are really quite extraordinary. Uh, the hollow ingot manipulator uh, and an animal centrifuge, uh, which I shudder to think what that is, but um, sounds interesting nonetheless. Um, 
And thirdly, and, and probably most importantly, is that if you read the decision carefully, uh, you can pull out some principled ideas for what it means for, for uh, activities to be subcontracted. Um, and I think indicators of that that you get from uh, Hadi are questions of whether the company is being reimbursed specifically for the time spent on design and, and R&D, heavy client involvement in a particular design requiring R&D, um, whether one, uh, the claimant company, is contracted to carry out uh, the design and manufacture of a bespoke solution may point towards um, the expenditure or the activities being subcontracted. So if you have those sort of um, features, it may suggest on Hadi that you have subcontracted um, R&D activities. Again, I would note that it's just a decision of the first tier tribunal, so it's not binding, um, but it does have those helpful principles if one can pull them out. Um, but HMRC are again arguing for a slightly, well, a much broader interpretation. Um, and starkly, uh, they seem to be suggesting that if you carry out R&D activities um, when completing a contract, even if the contract says nothing to do, as no, makes no specification of R&D activities, then those activities that you've carried out are subcontracted. Now that is very broad and it gives you a feeling that almost HMRC's position comes down to one of timing, i.e. take the example of uh, a contract to sell a Hoover. If I do a lot of work before and I uh, incur R&D and I develop a Hoover and then I sell it, HMRC would seemingly say, yes, that's fine. If I, uh, contract first to sell a Hoover and then I do lots of work to develop it and, th and, and then fulfill that contract, there's a suggestion that that might not be fine. I don't think that distinction of timing can be right. And what one has to really do um, is look at the nature of the deal and the underlying contract. But it seems to be a line that HMRC is pushing at least in relation to the litigation. So the takeaways from that decisions, those, those, the, that litigation and those decisions are one, watch this space. There's, there's going to be uh, decisions and, and appeals coming through later this year. Uh, two, have a read of Quinn. Uh, I think it's a good decision. I think it's written well, and I think it explains some of the issues. Um, and three, in relation to the legal considerations, consider what is the contract? What does it say? Um, how does payment relate to R&D work, if at all, who takes the financial risk of any R&D work, and what is the nature of the deal, the fundamental nature of the deal. Uh, next slide, please. Then moving on to some sort of broader practical considerations, and these apply inside and outside of the uh, SME R&D relief. Um, but have, you can see them as important in those in those particular claims. Um, first of all, um, in the value of discussions with HMRC and of agreeing issues, and this is prior to litigation, um, and it is incredibly important having a good team, having a good marshalling of the evidence, so that when you're going into discussions with HMRC, you can put a clear case forward on the evidence, you can put a clear case forward on the law, and hopefully by doing so can narrow the issues, can agree particular points, can agree that the work qualifies as R&D, but all you need to argue is over subcontractors. Um, and getting that done well early saves a huge amount of uh, time and money later on in the litigation because you're dealing with specific issues and can even obviate the need for the litigation because you're able to agree issues with HMRC and sweep away um, the problem. Secondly, in relation, finally in relation, secondly in relation to evidence, um, and evidence, I'd say in the context of litigation, um, but it's worth thinking about this before one even gets to litigation when one's making uh, the claim. What is the documentary evidence that you're going to rely on in order to show your claim? Um, 
what is the witness evidence that one would rely on? Who can speak to what's happened? Um, who can speak clearly and with some authority on what's happened and how that meets the relevant test? Um, that's going to be an important part of any litigation. And if you can have that in place when you're making the claim and prior, again, it should save a huge amount of time and money um, because you know what your case is, you know the strength of it, you don't have to spend a vast amount of time going through huge amounts of documents trying to find and prove your case. So in general, what that means is thinking about what are the areas that you have to prove, what's the legal test here, what are the facts and evidence that you're going to marshal to um, meet that test, I, the contracts, the evidence on payment, and what kind of R&D was taken out, and where those documents are, and having them ready and in line. And secondly, um, to note that this is an area that's in flux, there are, there are issues going through, um, and it's important to keep an eye on what those decisions are going to be, um, what happens in that litigation, because it should have an effect um, across a lot of different R&D claims. Um, and so keeping up to date with what's happening, um, keeping in the loop of those developments is going to be incredibly important um, over the next year or so. Um, so with that, I believe we're going to move on to a Q&A session, um, which I will pass over to Carrie for. Lovely, thank you, Ed. Um, and it's quite interesting to sort of hear your take and um, where HMRC are sort of are going at the moment. And I think it's prompted some questions that we'll do in just a second. Um, so just to sort of summarize and recap, I think the key thing is those preventative measures to make sure that you don't end up in an R&D inquiry territory in the first place. Um, and there are some tools that BDO has that can assist you in that. And I've mentioned benchmarking, um, and we've got this be the benchmarking tool, which you can access on BDO store and gives you a tailored report. We've got the R&D Rethink Service, which is a one on one to sort of stress test your claims, review it, give you some insight, um, help you with any conversations with HMRC, for example, through a BRR. Um, and then we've got the work that James and I do together, which is um, the tax disputes, the voluntary disclosures, preparing and navigating your inquiry. And then obviously, um, if it ends up in that territory, um, Ed is very happy to have sort of informal conversations with you about your sort of litigation strategy. So that's a sort of holistic sort of navigation guide through the inquiry process and how to avoid it. Um, so we're going to move on to the Q&A next. Um, but whilst we're doing some Q&A, we thought we'd just run a quick poll just to get your, your sense and your feel for where you are in terms of your R&D claims. This is totally anonymous. Um, so, um, yeah, don't worry. Um, we will do a, a thought leadership piece afterwards, just giving a feel for what people are saying. Um, but don't worry, your, your own individual responses will absolutely um, not get publicised um, and not go anywhere. Um, so it's, it's just to sort of get that, that sense check of how confident you're feeling about your R&D claims. Uh, whilst that's going on, I thought I'd just sort of pick up some of the, some of the questions. Um, so, Ed, a question for you initially. Um, in the Hadi case, um, were there any um, sort of were there any penalties? What was raised? Um, I'm. I don't think that there were penalties in the Hadi case. I'd have to go back and check that. What I can say is that in in relation to um, some of the claims that I've seen um, and some of the mass that have come towards me, there has been threatening um, on penalties um, and again it's it's a point about effective running of the inquiry and discussions with HMRC um, in that pre-litigation phase um, that you see that if you if you run that carefully and sensibly they, those penalty issues were able to be swept aside um, and and it's and it's a point to, to the sort of work that James um, does and in those discussions you can narrow it down and, and remove that uh, and I saw that in one of my appeals I don't think that there were penalties in Hadi or Quinn um, but, I, but, but, I, but I, would, I wouldn't want to stake my reputation on that. Brilliant thank you um, and James do you want to pick up um, on, on Bilal's um, first question 
um, about sort of, yeah, um, when the penalties go between 15 and 30 percent. Okay, yeah, I think there are two points here. One is, is, is there a penalty for the response time the same, 15 to 30 percent? I think that's in respect of failing to um, re respond to a scheduled 36 formal notices for information. So the failure to respond to HMRC initially is a £300 set penalty. And that can be followed by a daily penalties rather than a, a tax gear, 15 or 30 percent. Uh, in terms of behavioural penalties at the end of the inquiry, um, if there's a careless uh, error decided, the minimum penalty is 15 percent, you get uh, and a maximum 30 percent. The difference, the difference charged by HMRC will depend on how much the taxpayer, for instance, cooperated with the inquiry, provision of information, provision of documents, answering questions and things like that. So that it starts at the minimum 15%, but if information notices are issued, if taxpayers don't cooperate with the inquiry, don't provide information, then it moves upwards towards the 30% rate. Brilliant, thank you. I'll pick up on Hugh's net one question now about SME criteria. Um, so when you're doing the SME um, criteria and that test, you're looking at the worldwide consolidated group. So it doesn't matter the size of your individual subsidiary or legal entity that's making the claim. You look at the worldwide consolidated group and any companies that um, it owns 25% um, or more in and any companies that have invested more than 25% in that worldwide consolidated group. And that's how you make your determination. And that's at a group wide level. And then all the individual subsidiaries, if the group is large, all the subsidiaries must claim as large companies. And that's how quite often a very small company ends up having to claim as a large company, because actually when you look at the, the consolidated group or the investor base, actually it's got um, access to a sort of a large um, group and therefore it is large. Okay. Um, let's have a look. So, um, James, do you want to ask, answer Andrew's question? Typically, what what size, what range of claims are involved in HMRC investigations at the moment? Um, so, as a, a former inspector of taxes, I'd say, I'd say there's no minimum or um, value of a claim that HMRC will look into. But obviously, they've got limited resources. They're going to look at cost effectiveness in terms of getting money into the exchequer. So, there's no minimum minimum value, especially if they think that there's some form of abuse that case could potentially set president if it goes away to tribunal for instance um essentially we're looking at yeah cost cost effectiveness is running the inquiry against the, the the yield that it can bring in so there's no official minimum but yeah anything um, well, a few thousand pounds i don't think hmrc would necessarily bother with Okay, I'll pick up on Anne's um, question. So this is looking at the R&D reforms that come in from the 1st of April 23, accounting periods beginning on or after 1st of April 23. So as many of you will know, after that date, overseas costs can't be included in an R&D claim. And that's quite specific. So that's overseas um, subcontractor and overseas um, externally provided workers costs. So if you've got staff working in an overseas subsidiary and recharging their costs back to the UK, which is quite often the case at the moment, those overseas subsidiary costs can no longer be included in the R&D claim. So that's for accounting periods beginning on or after April 23. Um, we've had discussions with HMRC. What is allowed is overseas staff costs. So if you had an overseas branch and not an overseas subsidiary, those overseas branch costs could still be included from um, going forward. And HMRC has no intention of changing um, that. Um, and their reason and their logic being actually an overseas branch will be subject to within the scope of UK corporation tax. So it's, it's wholly reasonable to allow R&D relief for it. Okay. Let's, um... So, Ed, are you doing anything in terms of externally provided workers in terms of your cases, or are you sort of purely seeing um, subcontract and subsidised? Um, I, ha I haven't at the moment. Um, currently, what HMRC seem to be focusing on is um, subcontracted and subsidised. They seem to be the, the real focus of that. They're trying. To, I think they, they they weren't happy with the decision in Quinn. Uh, and you see that from the fact that they are 
um, that, <laughs> that they are saying it is now wrong, despite not having appealed it. Um, and it and from some discussions I've had with them, it seems as though that they seem to think that the subcontractor point is a broader one that will allow them to make up for the um, problems they've had in Quinn. So I think what we're getting at the moment, uh, at least on the litigation side of things, and at least um, from what we're going to see going through the tribunal, is HMRC really trying to clarify the underlying tenets of those principles. What does it mean to be subsidized? What does it mean to be subcon subcontracted? Um, and I think that's where the fight's going to be for quite a while now. I mean, if you if you think about it, the, we've got, so there are three appeals, as I say, that are likely to be heard by um, the FTT this year. Um, I would be surprised if none of them uh, if, if none of them make it onto the upper tribunal, um, I'd, I'd imagine that if if HMRC lose on these principles, they're going to want to go through and get some binding precedent um, and and appeal. Um, and so I, th I think I think we're in for a relatively long ride um, in which um, HMRC are really trying to nail down what these underlying principles are um, and then applying them. And then we might see a spread out into the other other aspects of the of the of the claims um, and it's just worth noting in the r d consultation that's just been launched they're actually consulting about the subcontractor point and who is the right party who to be claiming so is it the person who's doing the work or is it the principal who's paying for the work so if i was a betting person and i'm not i wouldn't be surprised if actually they changed the legislation going forward um potentially to sort of to avoid the litigation and to sort of cement their argument yes and, and i think i think that's interesting on the on the um subcontracted point and, and changing that because I, it, to my mind at least it would make more sense if the person who does the r d work makes the claim because they're going to know what it looks like um whether it meets r d etc they're going to have a better idea of how it works and they're also going to have the relevant documents uh to be able to show that it is r d work whereas if you always if as hmrc seem to be arguing at the moment that it's the person at the top uh, the payor they're not always going to know uh, in detail what's being carried out in order to fulfill their contracts um so to my mind, uh, it should be the person on the ground that makes the claim. And, and I think the legislation pushes towards that at the moment. Yeah, and that's certainly my feel from conversations with HMRC of sort of where we're heading. Um, just one final question, and then I'm conscious we've got other questions in the chat and we can answer, we will answer them offline. Um, so James, aside from subcontract and subsidies, in the R&D inquiries that you're working on at the moment, what are the themes? What are you seeing? What are they asking about? Um, there's obviously the technical points where the, the, the R&D has been achieved essentially for that company, for that uh, claim on company. Um, also looking at there's a lot of common errors are the, the level of the expenditure, things claimed at 100% when even if it, on a pure R&D project, staff costs, for instance, wouldn't necessarily be completely 100%. So that seems to be the things that they're pushing on at the moment. Yeah, and I think that picks up on one of the questions we were asked is, is um, is a hundred percent never achievable for R and D? Do we have to sort of cap it at an eighty or ninety percent? Um, I think certainly if you put people or contractors in at a hundred percent, you need to be really, really confident because it's one of those red flags that is likely to sort of push you into inquiry territory. Um, so I'm conscious we've sort of a bit canted through sort of how to avoid an R and D um, inquiry. What happens if you do and what happens um, if you end up in litigation? And I'd just like to thank everybody for joining this um, and particularly thank um, James and Ed for joining me on this webinar. Um, it's been great hearing their insights and thank you.